The Ghost of Pease Auditorium by Timothy Harrower The first to see it was Wilbur Dobbs, the janitor at Pease Auditorium back in 1949. I was closing things up real late one night. Awful dark and stormy it was, too, and this real eerie feeling creeps over me. This feeling like something was out there, floating through the shadows, waiting and watching. Well, sir, I'm walking along, just sort of whistling to myself, and all of a sudden this chill runs through me and my heart starts pounding. The air turns real cold, real damp. And then, next thing I know, I see it. I remember looking up right over the organ, right there where all them pipes are, and I see this fog, this fuzzy, hazy fog floating and turning in the air. And I'm thinking, what the goddamn... So I look closer and I see it's not just a bunch of fog. I mean, I can see the shape inside it, the shape of a man's face. He's looking at me and his eyes are open and his mouth is moving and he's got his arms rising up now out of the fog and he's pointing at me and his fingers start reaching out and the whole goddamn fog starts moving faster and faster, swooping right down on me, jumping, Jesus. That son of a bitch was going to kill me, I swear to God. My poor old heart jumped into my mouth, and I screamed and turned and ran like hell. I didn't stop running until I got to a phone booth where I called the cops, and when they came, well, we all went back inside, but shoot, we didn't find nothing. I thought I was crazy, but I'm not. I'm just real glad all them other folks finally seen it now, too. Anyways, I quit my job and moved away, and I ain't never set foot in that goddamn place ever since. Sure as hell there's a ghost in there, mister. Yes, sir. Ah, the ghost of Pease Auditorium, that strange, unfathomable creature that never dies and never sleeps. What new light can we now hope to shine on that dark old mystery? A mystery which has baffled experts for years. A legend which has already been the subject of intense investigation by police detectives, spiritualist and special university committees, Endless press coverage. Over 300 newspaper articles have appeared so far. One CBS television special and three books. Two by EMU professor Edmund Morger. The other by P.M. Sutherland, the famed psychic sleuth. Despite all the sensational theories, rumors, and speculation, one fact remains clear. Living inside P's auditorium, if indeed living is the right word, is the anguished ghost of a murdered man. For the past 32 years it has stalked those midnight halls. Hundreds have seen it, thousands have pretended to see it, and millions more were spellbound by it when Life magazine ran a three-page spread on the Pease Ghost in its November 6, 1951 issue. It is a sleepy little college town, the story began. But the drowsy denizens of Ypsilanti, Michigan, do not sleep well these days, for a sinister spirit lurks in their midst, a midnight ghoul who rattles the tomb-like stillness of those ivy-covered walls. It was, needless to say, a bit dramatic. And EMU administrators now suppress the story, issuing official denials to all those who request information. Please don't bring it up again, one administrative secretary begged. It'll hurt recruitment. Back in the 1940s, however, EMU President F. Walter Briggs took a sterner approach. Just what the hell do you expect me to do, he demanded. Tear the goddamn building down? Who, then, is the ghost? How did it get here? And what does it want? To answer these questions, we must return to the night of November 27th, 1947, the night of the murder. His name was Zoot Jackson, a slick trumpet player for a 12-piece bebop band called the Kings of Swing. Zoot was a dumb, lovable, big-hearted guy, a high-rolling, fancy-dressing, fun-loving ladies' man. He and his boys, quite widely known in jazz circles, had come all the way from New York City to play at EMU's annual Autumn Promenade. It was a well-attended affair. The biggest wing ding of the season. Every Hepcat, Bobby Soxer, 
Every smoothie, snob, and twerp on campus was there in Pease Auditorium that night. By 11 or so, the joint was jumping. Hoo-wee, drummer Benny Sims later recalled. He was blowing the roof off that place. And then it happened. As the kings of swing slid into their classic fickle moon, a shadowy figure crept unseen onto the stage. And as Zoot Jackson wailed into a howling horn solo, the furtive figure, a young woman, leapt forward pointed a revolver at Zoot's big heart and fired again and again and again. The crowd gasped. Zoot staggered forward, clutching his chest, scattering microphones and music stands as he collapsed in an unconscious heap at the lip of the stage. By the time Benny Sims wrestled the gun from the girl, Zoot lay dead in a pool of blood. Screams filled the hall as mobs of students fled for the exits. When police arrived, they dispersed the rest of the crowd and arrested Wanda Kleeman, 29, on a charge of first-degree murder. Wanda, an alleged prostitute and heroin addict, was apparently a longtime companion of Zoot's. She had decided to gun him down, she told police, when she discovered he'd been two-timing her. According to J.D. Baker, chief of police, the slaying was a vicious act of jealous vengeance. According to F. Walter Briggs, EMU president, it was a shameful embarrassment to the academic community. And for Elmer Zoot Jackson, the blood-spattered corpse, it was a grisly way to die. After the commotion died away, quiet returned to Eastern's campus for a time. Then began the strange stories the eerie rumors of ongoings on in Pease Auditorium. Footsteps, shadows, echoes, voices, the reports of an evil presence there. No one paid much attention at first. No one paid attention, that is, until the night the chandelier fell. Now, administrative officials have repeatedly insisted that it was an undetermined cause which somehow impelled this magnificent 22-foot stark weather chandelier to rip loose from its moorings and plummet headlong into the auditorium seats 80 feet below. Indeed, architectural engineers, insurance investigators, and Ypsilanti building inspectors all blamed the accident on a structural support pin, which allegedly snapped in half but the pin in question, broken or not, was never found. Miraculously, no one was hurt. The evening's piano recital had ended around 10.59 p.m., and the last few concert goers had cleared those ill-omened seats. Only moments before, the chandelier fell with a terrifying crash, shattering into a thousand knife-edged fragments. Those in the theater screamed and cowered in the aisles, Those in the lobby rushed forward to behold the glistening rubble and the large, gaping hole above. The eventual cost to the university, including medical expenses for those cut by flying glass, repair costs for theater damage, and the estimated replacement value of the chandelier was over $18,000. Even more costly, however, was the adverse publicity that again descended upon Eastern Michigan University and upon Pease Auditorium. Rumors spread that the building was jinxed or cursed or haunted. The plot thickened. Bizarre, unaccountable events continued to plague Pease Auditorium. More and more students and professors told of hearing sepulchral footsteps seeing ghostly shadows, sensing a sinister presence within the hall. A winter choral concert was suddenly interrupted by a loud, blood-curdling scream. At earlier rehearsals, choir members had complained of dampness and chills, of strange howls and moans rising up from beneath the stage. At another concert in November 1950, members of the EMU Symphony watched in astonished horror as an unseen force swept across the stage, toppling row upon row of music stands. Curiously, this occurred during a performance of Mussorgsky's Night on Bald Mountain, 
the symphonic incantation of demons and devils. One violinist recalled how she reached down to collect her scattered music and found the pages completely torn in half. The orchestra's conductor, Leonard Lombardo, finally resigned in disgust months later when, at an evening rehearsal, an invisible hand suddenly snatched his baton and hurled it across the stage. I refuse to work in a madhouse, Lombardo shouted as he stormed off the podium. Then near dawn on January 11th, 1951, a terrifying rumble like the shock wave of an earthquake came thundering forth from the vicinity of College and Cross Streets. Rushing to the scene, police found immense heaps of broken glass strewn about the exterior of Pease Auditorium. Each and every window in the building had, in a single instant, been shattered from the inside. Police could uncover no explanation for this accident. As rumors raced like wildfire throughout the city, Wilbur Dobbs reluctantly stepped forward to tell his story in the January 22nd Eastern Echo. It created a sensation. Within days, every ghost hunter and curiosity seeker in the state, it seemed, descended on Ypsilanti to catch a glimpse of the P's phantom. The Board of Regents ultimately voted to install full-time security guards at Pease Auditorium, and the stories these guards tell are the most fascinating of all. One guard, for example, encountered unearthly voices singing within the organ pipes in the dead of night. Another huddled in terror as a fusillade of stage lights came hurtling down at him from the ceiling. Another watched in disbelief as the huge black Steinway grand piano slowly glided back and forth across the stage as if propelled by an unseen power. A 43-year-old female guard was driven screaming from the building, not by ghosts, but by a swarm of rats. Oh, God, it was horrible, she sobbed to police. They kept coming and coming, thousands and thousands of them with these huge teeth and claws and red eyes, these burning red eyes. The woman later required psychiatric supervision. And still others told tales of violent pounding on the walls, of hollow footsteps echoing through the back rooms and balconies, of fires that would ignite and then vanish without a trace, of vile odors, odors of rotting flesh and excrement permeating the air in the midnight hour. In one six-month period, 13 different security guards quit the Pease Auditorium post. On October 31, 1951, the Eastern Echo sponsored a Spend the Night in Pease Auditorium contest. Of the eight original student volunteers, only one, William Wacob, lasted the entire night. Wacob now lives in South Lyon with his wife and children, and steadfastly refuses to speak about the experience. I don't trust you guys, he told us. You think this stuff is just a big joke, don't you? According to one Echo report, Wacob appeared stunned and deeply shaken when he emerged from P's auditorium that morning. I saw it, and it spoke to me, Wacob claimed, adding somewhat darkly. There are doors within doors and wheels within wheels and unseen worlds that bleed your nightmares dry. Not long afterwards, Wacob dropped out of Eastern and transferred to an out-of-state school, never bothering to claim his $50 reward. After life ran its spook story in November 1951, university officials began suppressing all information concerning the ghost's manifestations. President Briggs refused to submit to further press interviews. Faculty members were intimidated into submissive silence by threats of reprisal. A student senate proposal to conduct a seance in Pease Auditorium was firmly quashed. Perhaps you have forgotten, the official reply read, that this is a government institution, and we can neither indulge in nor sanction superstitious behavior of this kind. Despite administrative denials, however, the strange apparitions continued, and they have continued right up to the present day. For example, 
1973, sophomore David Reynolds left his trumpet overnight in Pease Auditorium. When he returned the following morning, he found the horn had been crushed into a shapeless mass while still locked in its case. I've never seen anything like it, declared Greg Zemensky, repair craftsman at Cardi's Music in Ypsilanti. It looked as though some giant just twisted it apart with his bare hands. One year later, Robert Hurley, a graduate assistant in the music department, made a tape recording of a student trumpet recital. When he later played back the finished tape, he was flabbergasted to hear not one but two trumpets, as well as a ghostly background of eerie clicks, moans, and groans. As they grew louder, Hurley said, I began to hear voices, strange, ungodly voices, all muddled together, this weird, horrible mumbo-jumbo. Ugh, I erased the whole thing. I didn't even want it in the house. It gave me the creeps just thinking about it. At a sparsely attended jazz concert in 1977, a startling paranormal phenomenon was witnessed by more than 100 people. Student body president Junie Keenan was there and recalls. Late in the show, the air got real smoky, and suddenly I saw these huge forms circling back and forth, way up above the colored spotlights. It was as though the smoke had somehow formed itself into shapes, into the shapes of actual people. I was frightened. My God, we all were, but it was absolutely fascinating. I didn't dare look away, not even for an instant. Miss Keenan now calls herself a believer. Greg Andre, a former harp student at EMU, tells the following tale. One night I was practicing late in one of those little practice rooms there, you know, and I kept hearing this trumpet music from out by the stage. Well, I, I walked around the corner to tell the guy to quiet down, but there was nobody there. It was the weirdest thing. Every time I'd go back in the harp room and close the door, that horn music would start up again. It was kind of bluesy, real sad, lonely sounding. Made me real jumpy because I knew there was nobody in the place but me. I ran out of there that night. But there were other nights when I'd sit up in the balcony, you know, off in a corner and just listen. Whew, I've never heard anything like it. In 1976, parapsychologists from Boston's Institute for Psychic Research conducted a thorough investigation of Pease Auditorium. Their conclusion? The building is certifiably haunted. After compiling detailed evidence of psychic phenomena, staff, staff director Dr. Roger Burns offered a plausible explanation. Such hauntings are traditionally the result of cruel or violent deaths, shootings, strangulations, suicides, and so on. The disembodied soul, instead of transmigrating naturally into the spirit world, remains glued to the material plane, seeking sympathy, forgiveness, or revenge. We must therefore regard these apparitions as external manifestations of souls in torment. In time, some ghosts simply vanish, never to return. Others merely drift to another location. Some can be frightened off by threats, prayer, or by the mere sound of a human voice. But it's safe to say that sooner or later, nearly all such spirits somehow work out their strange earthly attachments and move on. Until then, very little can be done. Exorcism? Well, perhaps, but such hocus-pocus rarely works. No, I'm afraid you may be stuck with your ghost for quite some time. Such, then, is the plight of the Pease Auditorium ghost, a victim of cold-blooded murder, shackled to a spiritual limbo wherein it is doomed forever to wander. Perhaps the inscription on Zoot Jackson's tombstone tells it best. Elmer Zoot Jackson, 1913 to 1947. He was taken away by his lady love's hand. May God lead him someday to that heavenly band. And whatever became of the jealous lover who fired the fatal bullet? Well, Wanda Kleeman was found guilty of first degree murder and served a 13 year sentence in Chelsea State Prison. Shortly after her release in 1961, she was attending a concert in Pease Auditorium when she somehow slipped and fell from the front row of the balcony. Doctors at Bayer Hospital tried desperately to revive her, but Wanda never regained consciousness. Police labeled her death accidental.